Welcome to the show and welcome to Quebec City. Tonight we're going to take you behind the scenes of a rock concert. Not just any rock concert, the group is the Tea Party, one of Canada's leading rock groups. This concert is part of a Canada-wide tour. And at every stop on the tour, the band's going to be playing with a different symphony orchestra. Now putting the Tea Party together with an orchestra may spell disaster, but not so for these guys. They've got science on their side. We're going to show you the science and technology that helps pull this all together, including how sound engineers can make sure you hear a harp as clearly as you hear an electric guitar, how something called pink noise is used to paint the acoustic shape of a room all before it fills up with people, why the concert the band members hear is very different from the one you and I hear, and why our appreciation of music is intimately connected to our appetite for sex. But there's no concert without music, and right now the orchestra is on stage, the fans are in their seats, and backstage, the three members of the tea party are about to start work for the night. It's time for this show to begin. Stand by, house at zero, house at zero, go, stand by, MC, MC, go. Alors, mesdames et messieurs, the tea party! Gentlemen, have a great show. The last time the sound guy checked his levels, this place was empty. Now it's full of 1,200 people and that completely changes the sound mix. Every person here is absorbing a measurable amount of sound and they're absorbing more high notes than low notes. So the first few minutes of any show are a pretty manic time for the sound engineer. definitely a diff whole different entity because now I'm we're trying to instead of just getting the, the band as the main focus we basically want the symphony as the main focus and getting the band underneath it to fill it out. the opening of the show. Although we do own about 45 different instruments from around the world, we don't own any everything, so naturally sampling has played an important role in our music. Digital technology provides a number of opportunities which facilitate the incorporation of the sounds of other places and spaces. One thing, sampling. You can sample the sounds of another, of an instrument from another space and place with a very different timbre and be able to use that sound without actually playing that instrument in live context. The one thing that uh, this band has always done is we've, uh, to a certain extent, we've exploited technology but in, a, in an organic sense, you know, so there's a real chemistry that's happening with uh, what the Tea Party's music is all about. The more natural sounding an orchestra is uh, with microphones is when it's mic'd from not close, but like not too far, but at least maybe a little over my head and like say 20 feet in the air. Just about a face 
file in instead of uh, right now we have these what we call isomax which you clip right onto the bridge of the uh, of the instrument and so the sound source is uh, it's right there it's the mic's picking it up it's like a few inches away uh, and so this way you know like a drum sound won't be as loud in that uh, as the violin itself I mean you don't want the, the, the exterior sounds to overpower the instrument itself Believe it or not, that was only the second time the Tea Party and the Trois Rivières Symphony Orchestra have performed that song together. The first time was this morning. The Tea Party may be on tour, but they're playing with a different orchestra at every stop along the way. So the first time these musicians even saw the music they'd be playing was when they showed up for rehearsal less than 12 hours ago. The first thing arranger Mark Willett does is run through some of the concert's more difficult passages. Question. He addresses oui. any question the orchestra has, and then it's the sound man's turn to get to know the orchestra. He wants to hear them play section by section. Deuxième violon, s'il vous plaît, même endroit. So that he can get a level from each microphone and get a feel for how loudly or softly they're going to play. Usually, conductors get sections to play more loudly. Oh, you still have room? I saw that room. Tonight, oh, yeah, that's that a collaborative room. effort, and these two don't have much time to figure it out. After the orchestras had a chance to get to know the music, and the engineers are happy with their sound, they start playing with the tea party. And then it's a matter of running through each and every song that'll be played tonight, and grabbing a few souvenirs along the way. Stay with us when we come back, more music, and we'll find out why a sad song to make the whole world cry. Welcome back to a Daily Planet special presentation, Rock and Roll Science. Here again is the Tea Party. This is Paul Silver. songs tend to be characterized, uh, and I'm talking about the elements of music that seem to transcend cultural boundaries, but they tend to be characterized by a larger amount of dissonance, they tend to be characterized by a slower pace or tempo in the music, uh, they tend to be characterized by our expectations being denied more than they're fulfilled. Sad music is generally not loud, fast, uh, simple. It's more complex, softer, uh, slower pace. Public concerts like this one were unknown centuries ago. Then, musical performance was only for the rich and the elite. But you might know the name of the man who in the 1700s changed concert going into a public activity, Ludwig von Beethoven. You won't say you're 
rock concerts and rock and roll music, popular music in general, has increasingly replaced what church used to do for a lot of people. I don't want to offend anybody when I say this, but rock concerts are places where rituals happen, where people can bond as a community, where emotional catharsis takes place. The structure of the song uh, emotionally, you know, what the song is conveying through the poetics as well, will play a big part in where it's placed in the, in the set list, right? So it's the story that you're telling throughout the night. You know? like a concert should really be like a story. I think if you ask most performers, they'll tell you there's a little bit of science to their, to their art. And for us in production, what we like to think is that there's a little bit of art to our science. On a show day, I'll tune them when I come in, and I'll tune them again in the afternoon, and then again right before they're played. And you'll notice that depending on the temperature, they'll be constantly changing. Thank you very much. This kind of concert can be mentally and physically demanding for the performers. That's why in the moments leading up to it, the three members of the Tea Party prepare much like pro athletes getting ready for a big game. Drummer Jeff Burroughs taps out rhythms frantically on anything he gets near. Jeff Martin spends this time quietly preparing himself mentally. And bassist Stuart Chatwood tries to relieve some of the tension. Was I too early with Inanna, the thing? Because you cued me and I believe... This is also the last chance for the band and the conductor to work out any last-minute issues from a long day of rehearsal. It seemed to me that I was about to go. And at this show, you also hear this backstage. We'll see what happens when that voice gets together with the Tea Party and a 42-piece orchestra next. Welcome back to Quebec City. I'm Natasha Stilwell. And I'm Jane Grimm. Now more of the Tea Party and L'Orchestre Symphonique de Trois-Rivières. And more of the science behind the scenes. Without further ado, Miss Christine Williams, please. I told you. An orchestra would be strong enough to, uh, to overpower a rock band by itself if we had enough players, say maybe a hundred players or so, or something really like uh, big, we would be able to overcome, um, uh, theoretically in decibels, for example. Why do we like our rock music so loud? An English scientist thinks he's found the answer in a structure inside the ear called the sacculus. It responds to sound, but only loud sound, above 90 decibels, like the sound coming out of these speakers. And the sacculus has connections in the brain to places that enjoy sex and food, which I guess is why everybody here is enjoying the concert so much.
Most uh, sound uh, around the 4,000 hertz, the 4 kilohertz uh, range is where the, 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 the greatest uh, uh, prospect for hearing loss occurs. If sound gets funneled in in that frequency, which is naturally amplified by the ear canal and set up by other mechanisms within the ear to be received most loudly, uh, uh, that's where an inherent risk lies. People use music almost as they might use a drug to change their moods. This is something that has uh, been established in many studies that mood changing is one of the primary motivations for listening to music. That's what people want to experience. Is there an instrument or a piece of technology that you'd like to invent that you wish you had? Well, I thought of a, a bass where it was fretted up to a certain point, then it became fretless for the top half of the neck, so you could solo really expressively, but then down low you could just keep the rhythm of the song happening. So. That's copywritten. <laughs> Computer becomes the brain for this uh, this mechanism on the bridge of my guitar. That's uh, it's been replaced with this uh, this bridge that has six uh, mechanical arms on it. And what this computer does is it translates um, tension into pitch. So, for instance, I can be in standard tuning, um, and then I can go to one of my open tunings, let's say like a, a low open C tuning, in 1.4 seconds, and it does it mechanically. How does it feel? How does it feel? How should I feel? How could I feel, baby, Christine Williams. That's over the course of the job. Needless to say, getting an orchestra, an opera singer, and a very loud rock band to sound like one is a challenge for the sound man. Getting them to sound good in every seat of the house is an even bigger one. But these days, engineers working shows like this have a secret weapon. It's called pink noise, and for hours on setup day, it's the only sound coming out of the speakers. Pink noise spans all the frequencies that humans hear. Microphones placed around the hall record the levels of pink noise and send the information to a computer. The computer shows engineers the acoustic shape of this room. For instance, if some of the low notes aren't making it to the back corner of the balcony, the PA is adjusted so that they will. And when we come back, you'll find out why the concert the audience hears is entirely different from the one each band member hears. Stay with us. Welcome back to a Daily Planet special presentation, Rock and Roll Science. Here again is the tea party.
So I heard there was a secret code The day I played and I pleased the Lord But you don't really care for I don't even need to have a guitar channel on my board. I mean, I do just so I can cover the room, but the people that are sitting in front of, of that guitar rig, that's all they're going to hear because he wants us to allow on stage. It's my job to deal with it. You can't tell him to turn it down because that's the way he plays. Everything's mic'd. The orchestra now is mic'd, so they're part of the rock and roll world. They're amplified this time, so I have to be aware with my in-ears, uh, monitors, with uh, the board uh, and the monitoring board uh, in front, be aware of what is the outcome dynamic, because it's not the same. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's, it's mic'd this time. It's not just analog. You know, it's, it goes through uh, an electrical process, and now I have to I have to adjust things. You know, sometimes it's too brassy for, for for bones or whatever, and I correct as I go along. So I'm sort of mixing a little bit at the same time my own orchestration. seen the guy at the front mixing for the audience but what about the band what did they hear well that's down to this guy here John he mixes what goes in their earpieces and what comes out their monitors and each band member hears something completely different I've got the drums up at top of the totem pole and then we've got the guitar and vocals and then bass guitar comes there and then the keyboard <laughs> that is an in-ear monitor, and the other one's open. So, and it sounds weird, but you just balance it off with your volume so that you hear sort of a stereo mix. But it enables me to play some more things in here that are direct, like my bass can go in there, so some stuff I really need to hear. Whereas this can be a more ambient thing where I can get a mood for the room and all that, and if anyone insults me, I can get right out there and take care of them, so, yeah. <laughs> I've noticed that as soon as he started the in-ears, that he is based guitar and my kick drum were a lot tighter together just because he's hearing things directly. I've heard it so many times and I, I know, you know, you got your strings going about here and you got your trumpets and stuff going about here, you know, you, see, you, get, you get kind of a picture. It's like a picture, you know, and you, you put in the color in there. Christine Williams again. Uh, where do you see this outfit now? Come on, come on, don't be shy. Come on. You ready, my dear? is open tunings, which is, you have a standard tuning guitar, E, A, D, G, B, E, so you can play certain chords in first position, but if you, you can change the tuning guitar to anything you want, so there's open chords ringing out, and that's what I do all night long, is I tune these guitars 
between different tunings for each song. You say life is bitter sweet. You tried so gracefully, but it's faceless company has let you down again. Say. Human voice, despite how incredibly rich a violin can be, a cello can be, or an electric guitar for that matter in terms of communicating emotion, the human voice can communicate emotion at a deeper, more primordial level. One of the key elements in any concert hall is reverberation time, the time it takes a single sound like this to die away. Most halls, it's about a second and a half to two seconds, but in something like a cathedral, it can be as much as 13 seconds. In this hall, one second. I have a computer program that I use to uh, basically uh, point out the, the frequencies, like sometimes I'll hear something, maybe an overtone, and, and, it, and it's just on the verge of feedback, or it's just too boomy or something. Well, I can tell what, what the frequency is, and then I can actually zero in on the instrument that's making that overtone, and then I can adjust in that, in that manner. Don't go away. We'll have more science, more technology, more music when we come back. Welcome back to the science of rock. Now more of the Tea Party and L'Orchestre Symphonique de Trois-Rivières. Watch what happens when a song starts. After just a few beats, heads will start to nod as people's brains analyze the rhythm of the song. See the differences between the rests and the notes. The brain changes its own internal rhythm to match that of the song. It's called entrainment. Sometimes it's not just heads that start moving, but people's entire bodies. Only humans can change their internal rhythms like this. They burn a savage soul, the twisted one in love. I feel this life slipping by 
We looked at Western listeners and Japanese listeners' uh, perceptions of emotional meaning in Japanese music, North Indian uh, music, uh, Hindustani ragas, and Western music as well, and found that in fact they can uh, decode the emotional meaning, uh, what was intended by the musician in all three cultures, and they can do that by attending to some basic elements of the music. Musicologists and more informed sociologists have said for a long time that meaning is encoded in sonic information. The quality, the type of bass line indicates a particular worldview as opposed to a different worldview. How bass lines come together with the phrasing of a vocal line, uh, a particular groove that a drummer is setting up and so on. All of that bespeaks a way of seeing the world. And when you have music that represents a very different way of seeing the world, you have your symbolic universe being challenged. What that means is you have your identity being challenged. There are many aspects of a song that you know can be appealing to an arranger, uh, but one that I like to, to find in a rock song is the sort of uneven rhythms and syncopations and, um, and oftentimes the, the, the weird modes of music, just like what we have here. We have an Indian modes of, of, you know, and melodies and sort of thing like that. And this is always challenging for an arranger, actually, so, and that's why their material is so good, actually, to be orchestrated. I actually still have you know, the boxes in front of me because I found that um, you know, being, being the front man and having to communicate with the audience, um, in-ears for me, like the in-ear monitors, uh, doesn't allow for that, uh, that necessary synthesis between you know, the, the band and, and the audience, like, especially with me being the ambassador, you know, between everything that's going on. Not 
to take anything away from bass players, but rock bands are driven by two main forces, drums and guitars. That's why on most rock tours, these instruments get their very own technicians. For the tea party, that's guitar technician Trevor Gilchrist and drum tech Paul Atkins. Paul oversees a small army that will spend a few hours assembling and shining the massive drum kit at the centre of tonight's show. Paul has been travelling with the band for years, so he knows exactly where drummer Jeff Burrows wants his drums to be and how he wants them to sound. On the other side of the stage, guitar technician Trevor Gilchrist sets up shop. He's responsible not just for unpacking the dozens of stringed instruments, but for keeping them in tune and in shape. So he travels with a portable guitar shop, ready to handle any repairs the instruments need. During the concert, you can see Trevor after just about every song, helping Jeff Martin make the change from one guitar to the next. Don't call these guys roadies. They're musicians, they're technicians, and they're practically part of the band. Coming up, we'll see Trevor in action and find out why the best shows are the ones some band members can't remember. Sister Amanda, which one? Welcome back to the show. Here again, the Tea Party. time the technology of the studio has allowed for the creation of records that were not easily reproducible with standard concert technology and we needed new types of technology in concerts to reproduce records because audiences are coming wanting to hear some form some replication of something they'd previously bought as this musical object that they adored on whether it's a 45 and LP or later CD It's, just, it's amazing that, you know, you used to do an outdoor festival with 40,000 people and you'd have, a, you know, 120 speakers up there. Now you do it with 18 speakers a side just because technology is so much better. What I thought about the tea party is that they were drawing on our natural uh, propensity for fear. I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting when listening to them that they bring in an exotic sound and then they have these very low, uh, slightly menacing sounds. And, and my feeling is that they were playing on people's desire for a fearful experience. Damage. 
Uh, I think we're going to look back on noise exposure at this level and see it as a product of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the technical advances of our age and this desire to incorporate every nuance of what we know technically without fully relating it to what it means to the individual personally. We've lost that connect between the human condition and technical capacity. We tend to be actually acoustic based, believe it or not. Right? That's the, well, that's our intention from the onset. But uh, then uh, everything gets electrified, and uh, you know, uh, it, it becomes a point where uh, we're just going beyond our own expectations. I'm very physical. I work very hard during the show. You don't feel much of that. It's almost like a runner, I guess. By the time we're done the encore and done the show, I just flop and I'm, and I'm done. The same with Taffy's. Yeah, I find, like, for me, the best shows that I've ever done are the ones that I can't remember. And I don't mean that, you know, through, like, you know, the intoxication or anything like that. I'm just talking about, like, if, if I'm really in, in the right um, frame of mind and I'm taking the audience, you know, somewhere else, right? I'm, I've gone somewhere else as well, so I, I really do find that I'll be backstage and I won't remember what just happened, you know, because it was just, it was bigger than, you know, the sum of the parts, right? Well, the science, the technology, and the gear all came together to provide a great performance tonight. A performance that was powered, incidentally, by 80,000 watts of electricity. Not to mention over a, over a dozen drumsticks. Well, the night's over for the band, the orchestra, and the fans. But it ain't over for these guys. Their night's just beginning. They have to pack up everything they just unpacked 36 hours ago, then ship it to Montreal for the next show. But that is it for us. I'm Jay Ingram. And I'm Natasha Stilwell. So, good night from Quebec City.